Thanks, Carlos. This is a real pleasure, and I'm looking forward to sharing my perspective with everyone um, today. So my talk is called Geometry from Computation, and I'll get into why. Um, OK, here's roughly what's going to happen. I'm going to discuss a bit of philosophy. I'm going to kind of cover some basics. Um, I'm not assuming that anyone who's attending this talk is a mathematician. So I'll try to like keep things very light and give you a flavor and a sketch for what's going on. Um, but I will um, also try to hope, hopefully leave you with a better understanding of some of these mathematical structures if you haven't encountered them before. So the main things we'll be looking at are graphs, which are sets of states and their transitions or vertices and edges. We'll then look at a certain class of graphs called cardinal quivers. Um, these are graphs in which we label the edges in a way that's kind of um, locally unique. We'll then look at type of graphs, which generalize graphs in a natural way to allow their edges to contain more than one, more than two vertices. Um, we'll look at groups, um, which are structures that model how invertible transformations compose. We'll look at actions, which are groups that act on a particular system. Um, we'll look at rewriting systems, which are uh, rules for rewriting discrete systems in such a way that you can generate graphs and they will be the, the kind of substrate for the geometries that I'll be talking about. And I want to leave you especially with a kind of good overall map of how these things all interconnect because they do intertwine quite tightly. Okay, let's start with philosophy. So almost all of applied mathematics is built um, on top of uh, continuous mathematics. Uh, that means uh, things called real and complex numbers. Um, differential equations make use of them. Um, we sort of assume as a starting point that space and time are continuous and that the quantities we try to model, whether it be heat, pressure, velocity, uh, populations for some biological system, these are all continuous quantities that um, change continuously with time. Okay, now what's the problem with this? Well, <clears throat> the so-called real numbers contain an infinite amount of information. Um, they require an infinite amount of computation to compute with um, precisely. Um, in fact, the, the subset of, of the reals um, over the unit interval that is actually computable in the sense that it can be, um, the computations involving them can be completed in a finite time has measure zero. So there are very, very few of the uh, real numbers that we actually have access to with the machinery that uh, computers, for example, give us. Um, not only that, but most of the interesting operations that we consider in, for example, analysis and mathematics require summing or computing with inf infinitely many of these infinite objects. So, I mean, there's a kind of uh, a philosophical problem at base here, which is that we're unlikely to ever be able to demonstrate that objects or processes in our universe um, have these properties because we can never complete an infinite amount of computation, as far as we know, um, with uh, access to the, the processes that are around us. So real numbers were developed at a time when we didn't have computers. Um, and let's think a little bit about what computers have given us. So they're not just tools. Um, they're also a kind of a basis, a substrate for a whole new kind of, of phenomena. Um, and this is something that uh, my former boss, Stephen Wolfram, has spent a lot of time thinking about. He wrote a whole book on it called The New Kind of Science. And he's and other people have examined how the computational processes can generate complex phenomena that just resist analysis using traditional mathematics. So where did we get real numbers from? Uh, like what's this origin story of them? Um, the technical answer is that they, they were needed to fill in a lot of kind of gaps in the sort of traditional classical story of mathematics. Um, they needed to make limits and calculus well defined, but the underlying machinery that kind of describes and makes them precise is sort of so technical that it's not often taught. And when it is taught, it really doesn't give much insight. So that sort of foundation is often swept, swept under the rug. Um, people, mathematicians especially, use real numbers without really confronting um, some of these underlying complexities. Um, we were originally motivated to develop real numbers by our intuitions about space, which you know, for most of our technological history, appeared to be infinitely divisible. Um, things like velocities appear to change continuously with time. But 
you know, for more than 100 years, quantum mechanics has, let's say, problematized this assumption. Um, and moreover, computers have given us um, wonderful new kind of space to explore things, but it really requires that uh, finite amounts of computation and information are involved. And so really the, the core idea here is that computers have given us a new intuition for interesting mathematical processes and phenomena that is fundamentally incompatible with kind of one of the, the core building blocks of modern mathematics, which is you know, real numbers. So the goal of the project that I'm involved in is what is the right way to think about a geometry that embraces that computational philosophy? So it shouldn't involve real numbers or references back to uh, the space that goes back to you know, the Greeks and its origin. And it requires rethinking much of the history of geometry and how we've developed it, but from a computational and combinatorial perspective. So in this talk, there's a lot there. So what am I actually going to try to give you today? I'm going to try to give you a flavor of how this is unfolding in the project. So I won't assume any mathematical background and I'll try to illustrate ideas intuitively sort of leave the rigor for other venues. Um, my other priority is that as an interdisciplinary con con conference, this is a very valuable opportunity to kind of find the places where discrete geometries may be lurking in areas of human activity that haven't really been pinned down yet. Uh, I really do believe this is true, that there's a wealth of phenomena out there that discrete geometry has something to say about, and we just haven't recognized it. So that's kind of you, the audience, to pick up on and um, maybe collaborate with me in, in developing. Okay, let's cover some of the basic mathematical ingredients that we'll use to structure all of the stuff we're going to talk about today. So we're going to use um, three sort of basic building blocks. Two of them are probably familiar to most people with mathematical training. Um, they're sets, multi-sets, and tuples. Um, we're going to think about how they operate in terms of what's called a multiplicity of elements in these objects. Let's start with tuples. So a tuple is a, a list of elements. So we write it just in parentheses like this. And fundamentally important is that order matters. So RG is not the same as GR if they're in tuples. Tuples can be empty. We write that in just empty parentheses. And we have some operations on tuples. We can concatenate two tuples together, which means sort of joining them into a longer sequence. We can also project larger tuples to be smaller, where we drop a particular element from the sequence, in this case, the second element. And we can chain tuples together. What that means is we ask that the, the last element of the first tuple is the same as the first element of the second tuple. And if they are, we form a larger tuple. And if they're not, we sort of give up. The computation fails, so to speak, and this is what's called a partial operation in mathematics. Now, these are often used for things like coordinates of points in space or rows in a database, but we'll see many examples. Okay, let's look at sets. Sets kind of like a tuple, except it's unordered. So they're sort of like a bag of elements that um, don't have any particular order to them. We write them with uh, braces like this. And importantly, um, you can't have an element more than once. Either it's in this bag or it's not in the bag. Um, also, um, they're unordered. Uh, so we can rearrange elements and it doesn't change the, uh, what set we're talking about. What are the basic operations? Well, we have a union, which is just sort of like gluing together two um, sets so that they form a larger set. We have intersection, which is finding the elements in common of two sets, and it'll be typically a smaller set. And then we have something called complement, where we take the second set and we sort of find any of its elements that are in the first set and remove them. Okay, this is sort of workhorse of mathematics. Most of mathematics is axiomatized along the, the lines of set theory. Okay, multi-sets are a little bit less familiar structure, um, but they're extremely useful, as we will see. The multi-set is like a set, but it allows repetition of elements. So we will use square brackets. There's no particular convention, but we'll use square brackets to represent this. And you can see here that B is repeated twice. So what are the basic operations? Just like sets, we can form unions of multi-sets. Now, importantly, if an element is in both multi-sets, it grows, oh, sorry, this should actually have three R's in it. Um, it grows in multiplicity. So it just kind of keep stacking up. Uh, if we take intersections, we find um, the minimum 
number of elements in either. So for example, there are two Bs in both, so there'll be two Bs in the result. There's, a, there's two Rs in the left one and one R in the right one, so there's only gonna be one R in the result. And the G, there's only G and one of these two, so it's it's not kind of in common between the two multi-sets, and so it isn't, doesn't appear in the result at all. Similarly, we have complement, which is sort of like trying to remove uh, all the elements that you see in the right uh, multi-set from the left multi-set until they can't find any more. Now, these are underused in mathematics, and that's probably for historical and sort of reasons of fashion, but I think they, they're due for a, a rehabilitation. Um, other names for this that are maybe more intuitive, like an unordered list or an unordered tuple. Okay, what are multiplicity functions? So these are alt alternate ways of looking at sets and multisets. So we'll indicate these with a little kind of sharp symbol there to indicate counting. And what that does is it takes a set or multiset and turns it into a function whose job it is, is to count how many times given elements occur in that set or multiset. So let's look at some examples. If we have the set with R and G in it, then if you ask how many R's do you have, the answer is one. If you ask how many G's do you have, the answer is one. If you ask how many B's do you have, the answer is zero. Similar with the multiset, except now the answers can be not just zero and one, uh, but can be any uh, natural number because given elements can occur potentially many times. Now, implicit in all of this is that there's some kind of base universe of elements that you're working with uh, for a particular case. And in this case, they're just the uh, three elements, R, G, and B. For multisets, as I mentioned, the possible multiplicities of elements are the natural numbers. But for sets, they're the so-called Boolean numbers, zero and one, um, which form a mathematical structure called a semi-ring, kind of like a number. Okay, now what's interesting maybe is that by switching to this perspective of multiplicity functions, we can still define the basic operations and they're the same for both sets and multis, they have the same definition. So to take the union of two multi-sets in terms of multiplicity functions, we just add the multiplicities of the given elements. And what this means on the right here is that we're taking these multiplicity functions and we apply them both to a particular element and then we add those two results afterwards. So the multiplicity of element in the union is the sum of its multiplicities in either of the two um, sets or multisets. Um, intersection is the minimum of the multiplicities in the two sets or multisets. And then complement is subtraction, where there's a little detail here, which is that uh, for the Booleans, you have to define zero minus one just to be zero. You also have to define one plus one to be one. So it's sort of like saturating arithmetic. If you go higher than one, you're stuck at one. If you go lower than zero, you're stuck at zero. Similarly for natural numbers, if you go um, less than zero, that dance is zero. And what this really means is that in the case of sets, no element could appear more than once. This is what this sort of constraint represents. And of course, no element can be present less than zero times. Okay, <clears throat> that was a very quick, Kind of two of some basic ingredients we'll now immediately use. Let's look at graphs. Okay, what are graphs? Why are they important? And how do we represent them? So um, graphs look like this. They're best understood visually, I think. Um, these sort of nodes are called vertices. Um, these links between nodes are called edges. And you'll notice that there are little arrowheads here to indicate that these edges have a direction. There's a sort of source and a target. There's the source and there's the target. Now there are actually many kinds of graphs. So I showed you what's called a directed graph, but you also get undirected graphs where there's no distinction between source and target. So we don't have a, a, a direction for the edge. It's just a, a line with no arrow head. Um, we can also have what's called a multi-graph where you have potentially more than one edge between a uh, pair of vertices. So here we have two edges between this vertex and this vertex. We can have an acyclic graph, which means that it's not possible to sort of find a, a loop where you're following all of the edges in their orientation. And then the directed graph, which we already saw. And then a kind of directed graph called a tree in which there's only one path between any two vertices, unlike general graph where that's not necessarily true. Like here, there could be several paths that end here. Okay. 
there are actually more kinds of graphs that um, are orthogonal properties to the other ones we looked at. So you can ask about how graphs are connected. For example, this graph is disconnected, which means that there's some pairs of vertices for which there's no path between them. This graph is weakly connected in that there's some pairs of vertices where you can't find a way to connect them that respects the orientation of the edges. So to get from here to here, you have to go backwards along one of these edges. And for the purposes of weakly connectedness, that's not allowed. And then we have kind of, I mean, for the purposes of weakly connected, it is allowed. For purposes of strongly connected, that's not allowed. And so when I say connected graph, it means strongly connected. Okay, why are they important? <clears throat> well, they model a vast number of, of situations in real life. For example, links on the internet, connections in a brain or neural network, follower relationships on Twitter, uh, capacities of communication links in a network, again, like the internet, uh, flows in a chemical plant, debt relations of relationships and economy, and I can keep going. And this has been like a real active area of research for the last 30 or 40 uh, years, and especially under the, this name of network science. Now, <clears throat> how do we represent graphs mathematically? Well, here's one way. Um, it's called an adjacency matrix. And the way it works is we will label these vertices and the rows of this adjacency matrix will represent sources of edges. And then the columns of this adjacency matrix will represent targets of edges. And this notation means, you know, look up the value of the adjacency matrix A in a particular row in a particular column. And what that's gonna indicate is the number of edges from that row, um, that vertex to that vertex. So let's look at an example. This particular edge connects A and B. So source, target, put a one there. There's only one edge. There we go. There are two edges between C and B. So this particular entry has two in it. There's one between B and D. And then one between D and B, which is on the opposite side of the matrix. And then all the rest are zero. Okay. Let's look at a concrete application of this. Um, this especially this matrix representation. So we're going to start with a kind of a token over here and we're going to allow it to flow along the graph according to all the edges that we see. So we're going to represent this token as what's called a, a vector, an occupancy vector. There's a one in the A um, row of that vector because that's where the token is. Now it flows along all available routes. So it kind of bifurcates, it splits into two tokens. And now we have a one and a one in this vector over here which represents the flow after one step. Now we move them back so we can keep doing flow. Uh, this one will go up to D. Now there were two down at C. Well, there's one down at C, but it, again, it bifurcated. So um, there are two tokens at B. Let's see what happens there. And that, that one, so it got multiplied by the two and became a two over here. So it's keeping track of the fact that there are two tokens in that position on that vertex. And we can keep repeating this. At this point, these elements will keep cycling back and forth. Okay. So that's actually, that kind of basic algorithm is one of the, the original claims to fame of Google. It might be interesting to, to know. Um, they had an algorithm called PageRank, which sort of exploited some linear algebra on the process that I just showed you to model the internet as a bunch of people kind of just randomly following links and then asking the question, where will they end up on average over a long period of time? And you can do that um, essentially by uh, diagnosing the adjacency matrix of the, the whole internet, which is one of the things that Google did early on and it resulted in much better results than some of the competing search engines. So it's a very practical kind of algorithm and idea. Now let's look at something a little bit more um, abstract called graph chaining. So we're now gonna have two graphs that are sort of shown um, superimposed on the same vertices. So they're colored red and blue. And what we're gonna look for is a particular pattern, which is a red edge followed by a blue edge. So that the target of the red edge is the same as the source of the blue edge, which I'm gonna represent with this motif. Whenever we see that, we're gonna replace it with a green edge that goes straight from the source of the red edge to the target of the blue edge. Okay. That's what the result is, but we'll verify that. Let's take a look. So let's look at this particular pair. 
So we've got a red edge here and a blue edge here, and that corresponds to this green edge between D and C. Uh, here's another example. We have a red edge from B to D and a blue edge from D to C, and that corresponds to, it gets rewritten to the green edge from B to C. Now we have a, a red edge from B to A and the blue edge from A to C, and that gets written as rewritten as a, a green edge from B to C. And the final example there. Okay. So let's take a look at what this means in terms of adjacency matrices. So I've written out the adjacency matrices of these graphs here. And now we're going to kind of organize them into the faces of a cube. And what I'm going to show you is how this composition rule kind of amounts to an interesting three-dimensional operation on this cube. So first notice that the source of the green edge is just declared to be the same as the source of the red edge uh, in our motif, you'll remember that. And that corresponds to the fact that we're joining these two adjacency matrices along their rows. So the, these rows are the same rows. The rows of the green adjacency matrix are the same as the rows of the red adjacency matrix. Um, similarly, the target of the red edges is declared to be the same as the source of the blue edges. And what that's saying is that the columns of the red adjacency matrix are the same as the rows of the blue adjacency matrix. And then lastly, the columns of the blue adjacency matrix, which are the targets of the blue edges, are the same as the columns of the green adjacency matrix, which are the targets of the green edges. Okay, so what happens? Let's look at an example. We're going to ask um, for the origin of these green edges here. Notice that they're two. They're from sources, uh, they have source of the B vertex and the target of the C vertex. And that's why they're in this particular entry of the green adjacency matrix. So we're gonna pay attention to this row and this column. Now let's look at one origin of this edge. So that is this particular chaining that we have here. So we have a source of the B vertex, target of the D vertex. That's why there's a one there. Now we have a source of the D vertex and the target of the C vertex. That's why there's a one in the blue adjacency matrix. And we're going to kind of imagine projecting them into a, a position in three-dimensional space where there's now a one that represents the multiplication of those two ones together. And that one kind of represents this green edge as we'll see. But there's another green edge, which is this one. Source B, target A, which is that one. Source A, target C, which is that blue one. And again, they form this sort of joint one uh, floating in space there, which corresponds to that green edge. And then we sum along that axis. So those two ones get added together to make two because all we care about is the number of edges. We don't care about how they were formed. And that's why there's a two here in this green adjacency matrix. Okay. Now, um, we formed uh, an ordinary graph by chaining these two graphs together. But there's another way of looking at this, which is that we're forming what's called a hypergraph. Now, I'll explain in more detail later what a hypergraph is exactly, but for now, you can think of it as an edge with a kind of middle element. This is what's called a three graph. Now, I changed the, this motif that we're looking for um, to form these new three edges, with these middle elements. And what that does is keep track of uh, what this vertex was that bridged the red edge and the blue edge. Let's take a look at examples. So this red and blue edge connected at this vertex, and that's why there's a purple dot over there. Okay. Now, one way we can see this um, 
to go back to this sort of cube is we can multiply these two um, adjacency matrices together to form what's called an adjacency cubics. And that amounts to finding all the non-zero entries of these two matrices, sort of projecting them in these beams, wherever those beams cross, we multiply those two numbers together. And it puts the corresponding results into this cube. And this cube is the adjacency cubics, which is a sort of three axis matrix, um, which counts how many edges have particular source, middle and target. Let's look at an example. So we're gonna look at the three edge that's formed by chaining these two, um, two edges, this red edge and this blue edge. And that corresponds to this one over here. Okay, so we have this cubics here. It has a source, which are the rows, targets, which are the columns, and the middle vertices, which are the sort of layers of this cubics. And as I told you, the way that we compute what these numbers should be is that we literally multiply together the um, adjacency matrices um, that form the faces of the cube. So the element, um, the number of edges um, with source S and middle M and target T is the number of edges in the red graph with source S and middle M times the number of edges in the blue graph with uh, source M and target T. Okay, now I mentioned earlier that we sum along this middle axis because we don't care uh, what these bridging vertices were. And that summing is literally a sum over this index M here um, to project it out and to be, um, uh, to be a matrix of an ordinary graph. Now let's look at that. That's equivalent to taking those three edges and sort of forgetting about the middles and gradually kind of morphing them back into being two edges. And that's that operation of projecting along the, this middle axis that we saw earlier. Okay, this is what's called matrix multiplication and it's a kind of workhorse of a field called linear algebra and mathematics. Okay, um, what we saw in the section was kind of what graphs are. We saw that graphs can be identified with their adjacency matrices. We saw that a flow on a graph is computed by the products of matrices and vectors. We saw that chaining graphs together um, amounts to recognizing a simple uh, triangle motif. Chaining can also be expressed as um, matrix, mat uh, matrix multiplication. Um, chaining graphs, as we'll see in a moment, um, amounts to, well, as we saw earlier, actually, amounts to this idea called hypergraph chaining, where we form these larger three edges, and then we collapse the middle vertex. Another way to see it is matrix multiplication is the same thing. It's some kind of higher product um, followed by a summation. Okay. So next I wanna talk about a particular application of graphs, um, which is fundamental to the way that I'm looking at geometry. And that's um, an idea called cardinal quivers. So what are they, why are they useful? Um, and um, uh, let's look at a family of particular quivers that are very regular. So a quiver is a directed multigraph. So it's a graph in where there can be multiple edges between two vertices in which we label the edges. A cardinal quiver is a quiver in which um, the labels repeat. So we can have a label C here that occurs on two edges, not just one. So these labels um, are sort of meant to represent a discrete version of direction. We ask that there's a particular property of these cardinals, and that is that given a particular vertex, there's only one way to follow that cardinal to arrive at a different vertex. So these are all examples where that's true. If you follow the C cardinal from vertex Y, you end up at vertex Z. If you follow the C cardinal from vertex X, you end up at vertex Y and so on. These are um, graphs in which that's not true. Um, here, there's no way to follow the C cardinal in its backwards orientation because there are two such C cardinals that are kind of incoming to that vertex Y. Similarly here, there's no way to follow the C cardinal in its forward orientation because there are two ways to do that. And that corresponds to the idea that there shouldn't be more than one way to, for example, go north 
um, a direction should identify like a unique transition of a, of a space. So why are these uh, structures important? Well, they're cryptographs with some notion of discrete direction, and those are those cardinals. Um, cardinals are the natural way to add geometry, as I hope to convince you today. And because there are multiple cardinals on a bare graph, multiple, multiple cardinal structures, multiple ways that we can label the edges with cardinals, sort of the geometry that this produces becomes an observer dependent activity. So it depends on how you choose to label um, the graph with cardinals. And it, it kind of um, makes geometry a little bit more subjective and enriches the possible ways that we can attach uh, geometry to these structures. Let's look at some examples of cardinal clues. So this is like a simple cycle. Here we have um, uh, lots of kind of small loops. Um, there we go. Now I'm gonna use an abbreviated notation for these cardinal curves, which is um, if there are two edges between a given vertex, in other words, there's a genuine multigraph. Um, oh, there's a, oh yes. I'm going to kind of only draw one edge and put two arrowheads on that edge instead. So here we have a green and a blue arrowhead to indicate that there are these two edges. And that sort of collapse them into one and, and draw them both like this. Okay. Now, transitive curves are kind of form the um, natural candidates for um, version of a regular Euclidean space that we're familiar with from continuous geometry. And I'll give lots of examples of these and we'll see how uh, uh, computational systems can generate these. Uh, essentially, transitive curves look the same no matter which vertex you happen to be looking at. As I mentioned, they were discrete models for um, finite dimensional space. And we'll see that they can be characterized in terms of groups when I introduce groups later. So the kind of simplest uh, example of this is a quiver with exactly one vertex. And we parameterize these family of quivers with how many cardinals are on that quiver. So here's um, one vertex, there's one edge that leads from that vertex back to itself, and there's only one cardinal, the red cardinal. This one's got two cardinals, three cardinals, and so on. And you can also imagine these as really being um, a ver single vertex with multiple edges, but we just draw them collapsed according to that convention that I mentioned before. So the most simple example you can think of for these kind of transitive quivers is a line quiver, where there's just an infinite line of vertices and um, Cardinal takes you from one to the next. Now, the way I'm drawing these, the way I'm laying them out on the page is not relevant. The only thing that's relevant is the connectivity structure of these underlying graphs. I should have mentioned that earlier, I think. Um, we can also make finite versions of these where we sort of truncate after a certain number of steps and there's only a finite number of vertices. Um, the next example is sort of circles, essentially. Um, eventually, you end up back at the same vertex as you follow this cardinal around. Um, another example is square quivers. So here there's two cardinals, red and blue, for example, and they essentially correspond to the ways that you can move a chess piece, um, a, 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 well, not a, yeah, a king on a chessboard. So you can move it. Uh, north, east, or south, or west, and um, you can also do this on a sort of infinitely large chessboard here, which is the, the true um, transitive quiver. A more interesting one that you don't see very often in the kind of built environment is triangular quiver. So this is two-dimensional, as I'll explain in a bit, but it has this uh, strange property that there are actually three cardinals, and there's a kind of um, pattern that forms that uh, makes these three cardinals kind of connect up. Here's the infinite one. Now let's move to three dimensional examples. So this is the simplest one you can make, but you can easily get more exotic. I'm only showing this one. Um, they're very familiar examples from crystallography where you can arrange atoms in a kind of cubic lattice or and all kinds of, of, of ways of connecting them up that um, there's freedom to do that in different ways. And, and this is really just the tip of the iceberg of a quite a large topic, but it's in some sense, the simplest version. Here's the infinite case. 
So lastly, there's one that's not really finite dimensional. Um, so this is what's called a tree quiver. So in a tree quiver, um, we start with a vertex and we always reach a distinct vertex um, no matter what path we take, no matter what cardinals we move along. And it keeps going like this. They never sort of reconnect. Um, it's obvious why you call it a tree, of course, but for the infinite case, um, there's no particular center vertex. You could start anywhere and it'll look the same. Uh, this is a tree with two cardinals. Um, another way to think about it is that it, it has a branching factor of two. But you can also consider trees with um, three cardinals, four cardinals, and so on. Okay, these are meant to be very, very simple examples of highly regular quivers that um, share some of the properties we're familiar with from Euclidean space, from the space that we actually live in. Um, and one of the most basic properties you can think of is dimension. So what makes a square quiver two-dimensional? What makes a cubic quiver three-dimensional? I used that terminology earlier. Um, and one way you can kind of make that a bit more precise is by looking at um, how a, the number of vertices that you can reach after a given number of steps grows with the number of steps. So for example, um, in the square quiver, if we take zero steps, we can reach only one vertex, the one we started at. If we take one step, we can reach five, the one we started at and the four neighbors. And you can see how that scales as a function of the, the number of steps you're allowed to take. And there are closed forms for these. So let's look at what these closed forms are. They're kind of formulas that describe how many step, how many vertices you can reach for a given number of steps. And what you'll notice is that if you expand this, these formulas out to become polynomials, there's a sort of leading term that has a given um, power. So for a line quiver, um, the number of uh, vertices you can reach scales linearly with the number of steps you take. For a square quiver, it scales with a square. Um, for a cubic quiver, it scales with a cube. And it's that line linearity or quad it's the fact that the power is one or two or three that allows us to kind of say, for example, that the dimension of that particular uh, graph or quiver is one or two or three. And the tree quiver is an interesting case because technically, if you to make this into a polynomial, you have an infinite number of terms. You have to take the Taylor expansion of that particular um, expression. And that means that there's no finite power. Um, the number of, of vertices you reach um, goes up exponentially with the number of steps you take. And for that reason, we can say uh, that the dimension of the tree curve is infinite. Okay, there was a sort of tour of some very regular quivers, um, as I mentioned, that, that are, form a kind of intuitive um, uh, analog of the spaces we're familiar with from continuous geometry. I wanna look a little bit at hypergraphs. We kind of touched on them in the section on graphs, but let's go into a little bit more detail about them because they're incredibly important. So we're gonna look at why they're important, what they are and how we can represent them. So the reason they're important is that they're extremely flexible. And I can just reel off a whole long catalog of examples of situations or structures or processes that are sort of naturally captured by hypergraphs. And let's look at a few. So one is aircraft routes. A single airplane can stop uh, at multiple cities on a journey. So you can certainly model that as a graph, but the key point is that the airplane is not gonna stop after one city and give up it has to make a route through four cities and it might pick up passengers, one place drop them off at another, but the kind of fundamental um, aspect of that journey is the full set of say five stops. Um, that's a, a hyper edge because it's not just two stops that kind of captures what that route is. So uh, a recipe when you cook, um, you have to combine multiple ingredients into a single result. Um, and you can't see that as a graph because a graph can only model one ingredient turning into one other ingredient. Another example would be biological interactions where you can have multiple organisms that are all interacting, reproducing, predating on each other and so on. Chemical reactions, very similar to cooking. There are multiple input and output uh, chemical species that participate in some reaction. Co-authorship. So people don't just write 
papers together in pairs. They can you can have three or four or five on the case of physics papers, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people are involved. Another example is educational curricula. So some course that you might take at a university, for example, might assume that you have certain prerequisites, more than one typically. And once you've done the course, you're equipped with several new skills, not necessarily just one new skill. And then from computer science, you have relational databases. So you can have tables that connect multiple entities together, for example, people, departments, um, contracts, and so on. And they're all sort of interlinked in potentially quite complex ways that involve more than just two entities at a time. Okay, so what exactly is a hypergraph? Well, it's got a set of vertices like a graph, and it has a collection of what's called hyper edges. So a hyper edge, so the most general way of thinking about it is it's a data element that contains vertices. Um, and there are many ways of doing this. So for example, we can have ordered hypergraphs where that data element is a, a set or a tuple. We can have unordered, um, sorry, that should have said a multi-set. Um, we can have a directed hypergraph, which has additional structure. Um, but when unspecified, we're talking about tuple hypergraphs. So I'll give lots of examples. Let's look at tuple hypergraphs. So tuple hyperedge contains any number of vertices, but the order matters. So let's start with two vertices at a time. Here we have a hyperedge with just two vertices. And you can see there's the tuple that's describing that hyperedge. You can have the same vertex more than once because tuples allow multiplicity. And these particular, those kind of patterns, those are what classic directed graphs look like. So we've just really described the graphs that I showed you earlier. But you can also have three vertices on a hyper edge. So as I showed you before, we can represent that by sort of putting a little dot here that represents this sort of airplane stops at a city, but it's going to keep going to the next one. And the corresponding tuple has three elements in it and that Y element is that middle um, dot there. But there are many ways you can do this. You can repeat a given vertex more than once. So here we're repeating the Y, the second and third um, stops of the plane are the same. I don't know, maybe it's circled around the airport and landed again. I, I typically wouldn't happen with airplane routes. And here we have um, that you start at a city, stop off at another city, and then go back to the first city. And then this is a very degenerate case where you can just keep repeating the same vertex again and again. As I mentioned, these are degenerate because they repeat a given vertex more than once. It doesn't mean they're bad. It's just um, in some situations that might not make any sense. You can have not just three, but any number of vertices, of course. And you can also have just one vertex. So I'll kind of indicate that by contracting this edge altogether. So the arrowhead and the, the sort of starting bar next to each other, like that little triangle. And then you can have, um, so there should be dashes here. I don't mean that there's one vertex as in this one vertex. Yeah. Actually, never mind what I just said. So there's a zero vertex, which is an empty tuple. It has no vertices in it. Um, I mean, at zero hyper edge, it's got no vertices in it. And, and there's no way to draw that. You can put that little circle anywhere you like on the, on the picture. So those were tuple hyper edges, let's look at multi-set hyper edges. Remember the difference with multi-sets is that order does not matter. So what I've done is I've changed all of these, uh, all the tuples to multi-sets and so now they have square brackets and I've got rid of the arrowheads. So now you have these little dots that are, appear anywhere along the edge. Again, these are the classic undirected graphs. Yeah, and those are multi-set hyperedges. Now, set hyperedges are hyperedges in which the data structure is a set, which means that each vertex can occur at most once. And again, order does not matter. And what that means is that these degenerate cases here are simply not allowed. So we just forbid them. And traditional graph theory, the Hyper edges with two vertices in them would, would correspond to what are called undirected graphs without self loops. Okay. 
So let's try to summarize the situation. What are these types of hypergraphs? We've got tuple hypergraphs where vertices are ordered and repeated. We have multi-set hypergraphs where vertices are not ordered, but they are repeated. And we have set hypergraphs where vertices are not ordered and not repeated. Um, a little bit of terminology we can introduce here. So all these different kinds of edges floating around with different numbers of vertices in them, we use the phrase N edge for a hyper edge with exactly N vertices in it. And N is called the arity of that particular hyper edge. So a general hypergraph contains edges of any arity. So um, zero, hyper, zero edges, one edges, two edges, and so on. But there are particular hypergraphs where we limit the arity to be fixed at some particular n. So for example, a two graph um, is a hypergraph in which all the edges are two edges. And that's just a classic graph. So a three graph is a hypergraph where all the edges are three edges and so on. Now the corresponding adjacency matrices have a kind of matching terminology. So an N matrix is a kind of generalization of a matrix in which they end distinct axes. When N is two, that's a classic matrix. And of course, an N matrix is the adjacency matrix of an N graph. Let's look at one last topic here which is this notion of directed versus undirected. Now, undirected hyper edges are the ones we've been talking about so far. It's not the same thing as ordered versus unordered. Directed hyper edges are a little bit more of a sophisticated idea. Those are directed edges where the source and target are not vertices, but themselves hyper edges. So we can use the kind of obvious terminology for this, which is, um, we can say a tuple tuple hypergraph, for example. That means that the source and target are tuple hyperedges. They'd be written like this. So a set set hypergraph would be a, a directed hypergraph in which the edges, the source um, is, a, is a set of vertices and the target is a set of vertices. And then there are kind of mixed examples where you can have the source being a tuple and the target being a single vertex like this. Now set set hypergraphs are the most common. The tuple vertex hypergraphs are also pretty common. A good example would be cooking, where um, you have several ingredients that you combine in some recipe. The recipe is the hyper edge. And then the result is usually just one dish or one component of the next step of the recipe. So that's where you'd see a tuple vertex hypergraph. So let's kind of quickly run through some applications so you can get a feeling for how widespread the um, scenarios these can model are. We have aircraft routes, as I mentioned, order is important. Um, now, having thought about this a little bit more, you're typically not gonna take off and immediately land at the same airport. So this actually should not be um, tuple. It should be an ordered list without repetition, which is a data structure that does exist, but I, I haven't mentioned before. So maybe you need to kind of want to put a little question mark over the tuple and little constraint there. Cooking recipes, multi-set vertex, as I mentioned. Chemical reactions, multi-set, multi-set, because there's really no order to the, 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 the inputs to a given chemical reaction. They just sort of like floating around in solution, they bump into each other, they react, um, and they typically produce more than one sort of output um, chemical species. Co-authorship is, so these are examples, by the way, of directed multigraphs because there's source and target. Um, the aircraft routes is an undirected multigraph because there's just one hyper edge. It's just the route. Co-authorship is another example of an undirected hypergraph. It's just a multi-set of authors. I mean, if you wanted to like say that certain authors are more important than others and the, the, the order that they were listed on the paper is important, then you could make that a, a tuple rather than a multi-set hypergraph. Curricula, again, multi-set, multi-set. Databases. So the rows of a database are tuples. And then rewrite systems, which is kind of a very important thing we'll get to very soon. Those are, um, have a, a particular hypergraph that comes up and it's naturally a set set hypergraph, as we'll see. Okay, one thing I wanna to quickly touch on is that you can see hypergraphs as themselves multi-sets. So 
bit of a mind bending concept, but it should be intuitive um, after you look at this picture. So here we have three edges or four edges. There's one three edge, there's one two edge, there's two, and actually there's three two edges. One three edge and three two edges. And here's the corresponding multi-set. It's a multi-set of tuples. So this hyper edge occurs twice. Um, and that's why it appears twice here. They're colored differently, but of course, it doesn't matter which one is which in this example, they're just together in the multi-set. You can do the same thing with graphs. Then in the case of ordinary graphs, all of these tuples would have two elements in them, would be two tuples. And now, what's interesting about this is it turns the adjacency hypermatrix into a multiplicity function of that multi-set because what that hypermatrix is doing is counting the number of edges um, of a particular form that connect particular vertices in a certain way. So for this particular hypergraph, there are two of this particular hyper edge. There's one of the XYZ hyper edge and there's one of the ZZ hyper edge. And so this is the multiplicity function of that multi-set. But similarly, the adjacency hypermatrix is also such a function where the inputs to that function are positions in that hypermatrix. So they kind of addresses of cells within that hypermatrix. And then the outputs are the multiplicities of the corresponding hyper edges. Now, what's interesting about that perspective is that it gives us a new way to understand chaining of graphs. So we saw earlier how you can chain two ordinary graphs together to make uh, a three graph. And notice that under the multi-set interpretation, where you represent these edges as tuples, um, we can use this chaining operation um, that I mentioned before on tuples um, that will take two tuples uh, that share the second element of the first tuple is the same as the first element of the second tuple, um, and we'll turn them into a three tuple. That is doing the same thing as the chaining of these two corresponding hyper edges. And from a mathematical point of view, the reason you might care about that is that that operation is linear with respect to the multiplicity functions. So from to an algebraic, this is a very useful thing because it, it means that you can form something called a ring, which we won't really have time to get into, but there'll be a little hint about it a bit later. Okay. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but I want to give a quick sketch of how hypergraphs model databases. So if you're familiar with databases, how they work, they're composed of tables and those tables have rows. Um, and essentially those rows are tuples. And what those tuples do is connect together different entities in the database. So like people and the departments that they work in and their salaries and their um, ID numbers or whatever it is. Now, a fundamental operation database theory is joining together tables in a database. And it's very similar to the chaining of hyper edges, except we're not just matching the last element of the first tuple with the first element of the second tuple. Uh, we're matching some arbitrary uh, pattern of slots in each tuple together to make a larger tuple. And um, it's not, I'm not the first person to notice this, is like actually well described by the CODS relational algebra that was written in the 1960s and 70s, but that was never phrased in terms of hypergraphs. So I think this is like a, again, just interesting example of how universal hypergraphs are out there in the real world. And interestingly, that turns database operations into B linear operations. So they're linear over these um, binary multiplicity functions. Um, another place where you can employ hypergraphs is to kind of generalize that whole story of flow that we talked about earlier with graphs. So we saw that flow is an example um, of multiplying matrices together. But you can do the same thing with adjacency hypermatrices where instead of multiplying two matrices together to form another matrix, you can multiply those two matrices together to form a three matrix and then project out the middle axis, which we saw. Now, one way to think about that is that for an arbitrary hypergraph, the adjacency hypermatrix is a kind of formal sum of all of these different um, objects. 
So that's the Jason's Harvey matrix. The first element is a single number. And what that does is count the number of zero edges, which is the same as the number of empty tuples, for example. The second element is a vector, which counts the number of one edges or one tuples, if you're thinking about the multi-set interpretation. The second element is a two matrix, so an ordinary matrix, which counts the number of two edges of given, for, of given forms, shapes, and it's the same as the number of two tuples and so on. Um, and we saw this cubics case here earlier, and that was the adjacency cu cubics of a three graph where we remembered that middle vertex that uh, was involved in the chaining. And in this particular case, this element here, this vector, which is a vector, so it's structured as a list, that element there represents uh, the occupancy of tokens on the graph as they sort of flow around. But you don't have to limit yourself to flow. You can kind of chain up longer and longer hypergraphs that remember where the token went as it kind of propagated along the underlying graph. Um, and for more information about that, um, I recommend that you read our paper called Heaps of Fish, which you can find on the arity.science website, where we kind of go into some of the uh, more technical details of how this works and related to some um, existing mathematical literature. Uh, you can find that there under this uh, output section at the bottom of that page. Okay. So the summary of this section is, Hypergraphs are natural generalizations of graphs in which vertices are not just, um, edges are not just two vertices at a time, but any number. They model configurations of things where the number of things that are involved uh, that are kind of connected together can vary. Um, you can think about them as multi-sets of tuples or sets or more multi-sets. In other words, multi-sets of multi-sets. Um, you can also think about them as adjacency hypermatrices. And those hypermatrices are the multiplicity functions of the hyperedges in the multiset interpretation of the hypergraph. Chaining corresponds to a generalization of matrix multiplication. Yep, that's what I hope that you can take away from this section. Next, we're going to talk about groups and after that, um, it should be a lot, a lot clearer how um, the quivers that we introduced earlier um, can be generated. Um, so what are groups? Why are they important? How do we represent them? And how do they generate graphs? And particularly car uh, cardinal quivers. So the intuitive definition is that a group is a collection of reversible transformations. So we don't care what's being transformed. We only care about how those transformations chain together and how they kind of affect each other. Um, we can only chain transformations together in a sequence, sort of a temporal sequence. So first this transformation, then that one, then that one, and you're applying them one after another to something. So we'll write this chain sometimes with dots or just by putting the symbols next to each other. And the important part is that that chain itself is a transformation because you just like ignored the individual ingredients and you treated the whole thing like a transformation, you know, doing all three things one after another together. Um, and the interpretation I'm gonna use, the convention I'm gonna use is that FG means that you first apply F and then apply G. It's the opposite of how most people do it, but it's more intuitive. Importantly, only the order of the sequence matters. So another way of saying that is that these transformations are not context sensitive. Transformations are also always compatible with each other. So you can never do two things that somehow conflict with each other. And if you have something that satisfies, if you've got a set of transformations that satisfies all these properties, then you have a group. Okay, there's a mathematical definition which I'm going to skip over. Okay, some notations. So the group elements, those are those transformations that make up the group. So a generator of a group, generators, it's a collection of elements that together you can combine in suitable ways to make any transformation in the group. So if you have things that, that are universal like that, then 
they're kind of primitive in some sense, and those are form uh, generators of a group, generating set. So a group word is just, when I write on FGH, for example, that's a group word. It's usually with respect to generators, so the F and G and H are the generators. So a presentation of a group is a way of fully describing a group by just coming up with some names for its generators and then saying what relations they must have. In other words, what rules you have to turn group words into other group words that represent the same thing. Uh, that's a little bit abstract, but we'll, it'll become more intuitive when we work through some of the examples that make it really sort of clear that it's a computational process. And then of course, a finite group is a group where the number of elements is finite and those are the only ones we'll be looking at. Okay, why are they important? Well, um, they naturally characterize symmetries of objects, as you'll shortly see. Um, each transformation in that sort of set that makes up the group elements, they preserve some core property of an object. Um, and when you have the situation, we call that the symmetry group of that object. Now, historically, um, they were invented many hundreds of years ago to explain something that was of particular interest to mathematicians at the time. Historically, a massive breakthrough and spectacular that was come up by someone who was, I think, like 20 years old at the time, and like crazy. Um, it also revolution, revolutionized our understanding of geometries through a later development called the Erlangen program, which I won't have time to go into now. Um, it's also an essential part of modern physics, um, characterizing fundamental forces and particles. Um, I should mention as well that a, a vast amount of 20th century mathematics was focused on better understanding groups and, and what kind of groups there are out there, especially finite groups. And the sort of triumph of 20th century mathematics that that project was finally completed in, I think, the 90s. Okay, but we're going to start with very simple groups and just look how they work and get a kind of feeling for what, what they do. Um, and to do that, we're going to think about a triangle. So we're going to consider a triangle. We're going to put an, a label on there, F, so we can sort of see how um, the group of transformations that we're going to apply, how they, how they change this. So there's going to be only one generator that we're going to look at first, and that generator is just a rotation of the group clockwise by um, one third of the revolution. Now, I should mention that groups always have the empty word in them. That means the transformation where you just don't do anything. It's like a no op, it's a, um, a vacuous transformation. And people usually write that as E. Okay. So let's see how uh, we can sort of spin this uh, triangle round and what that tells us about the group. Okay. So we're gonna apply this generator R, and then just label uh, um, the result with what we did. And if we do that again, we get this shape. And if we do that one more time, we actually back where we started. So notice that's the same as that, which means that this group word is the do nothing transformation because to get, we did nothing, we ended up kind of canceled ourselves out after we did those three operations, one after another. So we can just forget about that. So that's, that kind of tells us everything we need to know about the group. Um, it's got three elements, the do nothing transformation, rotation by 120 degrees and rotation by 240 degrees. It's generated by this original clockwise rotation by 120 degrees. And it, it's only got this one relation, which is, that if you do it three times, if you rotate three times, nothing happens. Um, this particular group is one of the simplest groups there is. It's called um, C3, one of the cyclic groups. And it has the presentation where all you're saying is there's one generator and the only thing I know about it is that if you do it three times, it, evap it cancels out, it evaporates. This is called a relator. Now we're gonna look at a little bit more complicated group. And we're gonna do that by having one additional generator, which is a horizontal flip. So we're just gonna start with the part we know about, which is this part. And now we're gonna apply that flip generator. And notice we again labeled what we did to get here. 
and we're gonna to fill out the rest of this table we can now apply if we apply to flip again we'd be back where we started so now we're gonna we're gonna rotate so I'm, I'm doing flip then rotate to get here and then one more rotation to get there and if I did a, th a third rotation, we know that we'd end up back over here. So this completes the, all the possible transformations we can do if our primitive operations are rotate by 120 degrees and flip. Okay, now what we just did there, sorry, I didn't warn you. <laughs> what we just did there is um, we applied a flip we, we still need to see what flip does to, to all of these existing elements. We haven't needed like fully characterize all of the relations that happened. So we're going to apply flip to this guy. And what happened was we ended up over here. So that's telling us that rotate, which is this, followed by flip, RF is the same as what we already generated, which is flip followed by two rotates. Let's do that again with another element. So here we saw that rotating twice, which is this, followed by flip gives us this. And that's the same as if we first flipped and then rotated. So that's what that equation, that relation means. If you flip twice, you get back where you started. I mentioned that earlier. And then just filling out this table. Okay, so a little notational cleanup is that two clockwise rotations is the same as one anti-clockwise rotation. So earlier I mentioned that all transformations have to be reversible. That's an important property of a group or kind of axiom of a group. And the way that you talk about the, the version where you undo an operation is it's called an inverse of that particular element. And I'm gonna write it with a little bar underneath. So just stands to reason that rotating twice um, clockwise is the same as rotating once anti-clockwise. So I can just use this to clean up this table a little bit. Like that. And now we have the full set of, of operations of the group and we know how they all relate to each other. Okay, this is called the dihedral group of order three or size three. And it's really important to notice that it's unlike the psychic group, it's not commutative. And what that means is that you can't just do a bunch of operations in any old order. The order actually does matter. And we can see that because of some of those operations we just did. For example, flipping and then rotating as we saw, one of those equations was that flipping and rotating is the same as rotating in the opposite direction and then flipping, which is not the same as rotating and then flipping. So order does matter, right? Like you can't just decide what to do without saying what order to do it in. Let's see that in practice. But here we're gonna flip and rotate. And in this one, we're gonna rotate and then flip. We get different things. Okay, now we've got enough sort of intuition about groups to see how they produce graphs. So when we were filling out the table, we acted on those shapes with the generators. So the generator sends a shape to another shape. That should sound a little bit familiar, that's a graph. The edges of the graph are labeled by the generators that did that transition. And those labels are the cardinals of a cardinal quiver. They, in fact, satisfy the local uniqueness property automatically, just thanks to the axioms of a group. And that quiver is what we call the Cayley quiver. So this is the Cayley quiver for the dihedral group of order three. So um, if you apply R again and again, you sort of just cycle around. If you flip, then what it really does is change the meaning of rotation to be the, the other way around. And then if you keep flipping, you just keep switching back and forth. So this 
graph tells you everything that can happen in this group. Now, one important generalization is that you can act on a different kind of shape from the one you used to understand the original group. So here we're gonna act on a more symmetric shape. So this shape has just got a line down the middle. And when we take an, a transformation like rotation and we act on that particular shape, uh, we write this with a little left facing triangle like that, the notation I really like. Um, and we see that the answers is sort of pointing down to the right there. But importantly, notice that flipping does nothing to the upward facing triangle, of course, but it does do something to the rightward facing triangle, turns it into a leftward facing triangle. So this also gives us a quiver and that quiver is called the action quiver of this group on this initial element here. And we can see it over here. So we now only have three possible shapes. Um, and that original very symmetrical structure is a little bit broken. Um, what's happened is we've kind of collapsed some things down together to make this quiver from the original quiver. I shouldn't get into that, it's a little complicated. Okay, uh, let's get this. Okay, let's talk about presentations a little bit. I kind of hinted at what presentations of groups are, but I wanna get into that a bit more deeply because it connects deeply to, to these Cayley quivers and action quivers. So the way we write a presentation is we pick the, the generators of the group. We just, they're just arbitrary names, doesn't matter what they are. We lift them on, list them on the left here. And then we have these things called relators. And the relators are written on the right. And they are those equations that you saw earlier that kind of characterize how um, group words should be considered equivalent to each other. So we make words out of these, these generators and then we decide when two of them are the same by applying relators. So the overall recipe for how to generate all the elements of the group is to form all possible words and they can be any length, they can keep getting longer and longer. So there are actually infinitely many of these. But then you combine those words together which are convertible to one another by relators. A little abstract, so let's see what that looks like. Um, this is out of place, this section. It's actually not out of place. We'll look at concrete examples of these presentations in a second. Um, so here's some even simpler groups than the ones we considered before. So the integers form a group where the way that you combine two integers is to add them. Um, the identity of this group, in other words, the thing that does nothing, the do nothing operation is to add zero. Of course, that doesn't change anything. Um, inverse of a group element is to subtract that element uh, instead of to add it. Um, people call that, just write that as Z. And the Cayley quiver is one of the familiar transitive quivers we saw earlier. It's the infinite line quiver. It's the line that stretches on forever. And the cardinal is the generator of adding one. It's like a pairs of integers. So what does it mean to add two integers? Well, we add them element wise. So we have a pair AB and another pair A prime, B prime, then we add the A's together and we add the B's together. The identity is obviously zero, zero. The inverses is again, you just invert each element individually. People call that Z2. And we can take two particular generators. For example, we can take one zero and then zero one, call them X and Y. And the Cayley quiver of this group is the infinite square quiver. Uh, notice that um, the identity is kind of in the middle here. It's in some sense, it's the origin. And as we apply the X um, generator, we keep adding one to the first element of the tuple as we apply the Y generator, we keep adding one to the second element of the tuple. So this is in a way a coordinate system. Now my AirPods are on. Okay. Um, lastly, we're gonna look at triples of integers. So just the same as with the pairs, 
Uh, we have three generators. Um, sorry, this should read 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, just an error. Um, the Cayley quiver is sort of an infinite cube where, again, you kind of go into the screen or you go up or you can go right. I'm going to show you something a little interesting, which is that if you choose different generating sets, different choices of generators, you get different Cayley quivers. So here I'm going to pick uh, another three generators. Here, instead of one, zero, zero, I'm going to take one minus one, zero. And instead of zero, one, zero, I'm going to take zero, one, minus one, and so on. And interestingly, that gives the triangular quiver. It turns out this is the same as using a particular presentation here, um, where this particular relator RGB equals E encompasses the fact that if you do R and you do G and you do B, you back where you started. Now, I wish I could make this more intuitive that this produces a triangular quiver, but that would take a little bit more time than we have right now. Okay, but here is something that's maybe a bit more intuitive, which is we can take the presentation of the um, of Z2 and we can add two relators. And the relators we're gonna add are that if you apply the R generator W times and you apply the B generator H times, you back where you started. In each case, R W times is you back where you started or B H times you back where you started. What that'll do is roll up the square and triangular lattices into sort of donuts into toruses. Let's see what that looks like. So you can plot them in two dimensions here where they sort of wrap around. You've got little labels here that show you that if you take the R cardinal over here, you end up back at this vertex here. If you take the B cardinal up here, you end up at this vertex here. Or you can put them in three dimensions where they're literally on a torus where those properties are respected. And what these relators here do is they tell you how far you have to go to make this axis of the torus or to make the kind of inner tube axis of the torus. You can do the same thing with the triangular quiver. Let's look at a, a kind of a fascinating example of another group and the quivers that it generates. We're gonna look at permutations of the elements of a list. People generally call the symmetric group of length n or order n. And the way to see it is that you're acting on lists by swapping elements in some um, way. So for example, um, we're gonna swap elements one and two, that's the group element. And we're acting on the list of red and green and blue. And we get green and red and blue because we swapped the first two elements. Or we could equally well have swapped the second and third elements. And then we go from red, green, blue to red, blue, green. And the quiver geometries here are quite interesting. The, I mean, the Cayley quivers. So for S3, with those choices of generators, you get a hexagon. For S4, where you're acting on a list of length four, you get what's called a permutahedra. In fact, all of these are called permutahedra. Um, but this one is a particularly interesting example. Um, you have to really see this rotating in 3D to get the full effect, but you can notice that it's made up of hexagons and squares that are glued together in a complicated way. I think it's a truncated octahedron, but I might be wrong about that. Okay, um, another example. Sorry, they'll be over soon, I promise. Um, this is, in fact, in a way, the most important example. This is the Cayley quiver of the free group and what a free group is, is it's a group that's got generators, but no relations at all. So that means every possible word you can form is a distinct group element. So you never have the case where rotating and flipping is the same as um, flipping and then anti and then um, flipping and then rotating in the other direction. Like there's no relations like that. Anything that you can do is a completely unique action that does not yield the same thing. Um, people write as Fn. And the Cayley quiver for this is a tree. And it's easy to see why. 
the reason why is that if you start at this element here, which is the, the do nothing operation it represents the don't do anything. And then you form a particular group word by taking cardinals in some order, let's say X and then Y and then X and then keep going Y and X and so on. That's unique sort of by definition of how presentations work, whatever you ended up at, that group element is unique. It's not the same as any other group element, which means that every path is unique. So every pair of vertices has exactly one path that connects them. You never reconnect. That's the definition of a tree. Now, how does this relate to some of the other um, Cayley quivers we've looked at? Well, the way it works is that um, the relators, as I mentioned, they summarize which pass in the Cayley quiver must close. So let's look at some examples. So let's look at the square quiver and we've got the relator that we saw. I don't think I actually mentioned this. I should have. The relator for the presentation of the square quiver is x, y equals y, x. And you can rewrite that. If you'd like to take things over to the other side, you have to flip them around and negate them and you end up with this word um, x, y, in, inverse x, inverse y. And that must be the same as E, as the do nothing operation. And what that's telling you is that if you apply the X generator, the Y generator, inverse X, inverse Y, you back where you started at the do nothing operation at the original group element, right? So the original shape that you started with, that you were acting on, um, which is another way of saying that that path must close. So really what this relator is doing is forcing that path to close. So for the triangular quiver, the relevant relator, you actually started with the relators for the cubic quiver, and then you imposed one additional one, which is RGBs is the identity. And that's saying, again, take R, because you can see the red cardinal underneath, take B, take G, and you back where you started. Um, another example would be um, the three cycle quiver or the um, cyclic group of order three, where the relators are to the threes is the identity uh, uh, group element. Again, that's saying that if you take R three times, you back where you started. That literally defines what a circle is, right? And then for the dihedral group, it's a little bit more subtle. You can rearrange it slightly and it ends up saying that if you flip and rotate and flip and rotate, you back where you started. And you can see that that path does indeed close in the, the nested triangle like, um, Cayley quiver that we saw earlier. Okay, and so you can visualize this. You can make the Cayley quiver of the, of the tree. I mean, the Cayley quiver of the free group, which is a group with particular generators and no relators. And then really what adding relators to that does is collapse that tree by identifying all of the vertices that are connected by one of those paths and saying, please close this loop. This loop wasn't closed before in the free group and the that Cayley quiver, because no group, no parts are closed in the Cayley quiver. I want it to close. That's what imposing the relator does. And so we can kind of animate that process. So that's what it looks like. You're taking the tree, no relators, turning it into the square quiver where you've got the relator x, y equals y, x. And that collapses vertices together that all have to close under that um, definition of the presentation of Z2. Now, this connects to a more sophisticated idea called a path homomorphism, which I'll maybe touch on if I have time, but um, we won't be able to go into it. Okay, let's summarize. We saw integer addition, which gives us a line quiver. The cyclic group gives us a cycle quiver. Dihedral group gives us this complicated thing of two linked cycles, at least for, um, yeah, well, actually for any end. Um, Z2 is sort of like infinite chessboard. That gave us a square quiver. Z3, the group of cubic chessboard moves gave us a cubic quiver. And then a different choice of presentation gave us the triangular quiver. Okay, maybe we take a little moment to rest. I'll drink a glass of water. Just to summarize what we did, 
we looked at groups, which are these sort of foundational objects in, in mathematics, and we saw how they sort of naturally give rise to extremely regular family of quivers that we could have intuited beforehand were a good way to think about um, sort of discrete forms of space. Um, Next. Okay, Tali. Yes. Yes, so just to remind uh, everyone that we, so we have another session in an hour from now. So this session was scheduled to finish at about 30 minutes from now. So it is okay to go over time from the next 30 minutes. And, but we, we should probably finish at about quarter to, so in 45 minutes. Just letting, letting you know so that if, if you want any time for discussion, um, maybe it's better to sort of go to discussion. And I mean, I'd let you judge. I mean, we can use this 45 minutes as you prefer, but just to give a, a time reminder to everyone. Okay, what I'm going to do is there's a little section that I'm going to skip, which will help us finish on, well, not on time exactly, but at least leave some time for discussion, I think. Um, where is it? I think it's collapsed. Where is it? Uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll skip through it when I get there. I think it's here. These should not be. Skip all of these guys. It's a pity, but okay. There we go. Cool. I'm sorry, this is kind of, in a sense, the heart of what I was supposed to get to, and we're only getting to it now, but it's sold on. Okay, as before, what are rewriting systems? Why are they important? How do we represent them? How do they generate graphs? Actually, the same agenda items that we had for um, groups. Okay. Definition is, we have a set of global states of some computational system and it changes from system to system, but we'll see examples. Then we have a set of rewrite rules and these form a kind of schema for how to rewrite those global states. They can be non-deterministic, these rewrite rules, in the sense that, in the very specific sense that, there can be more than one rewrite rule that can apply to any given global state. And one special case for that, I mean, it could be that there's several rules, right? And each of them applies, or it could be that there's just one rule, but it can apply in more than one way. So when a rewrite rule could apply, when there's sort of, it finds some part of the global state that it recognizes, we call that a match. Now, a global state that has no matches is called a halt state, a halting state. Um, and literally the evolution of that system, if it reaches that, that state with no matches, it stops because there's nothing more that can change. So this is a kind of discrete model for dynamics or of some kind. And again, you can see that this is gonna produce a graph because if you take the global states as being the vertices of some graph, the rewrite rules generate directed edges that connect each input state to the result of the rewrite. So that's called a rewrite graph, transition graph, multi-way graph, there are lots of names for it. So the sources of this graph are the global states that we kind of seeded the system with. We started with these states and we said, how can these states evolve under these rewrites? And sinks, if there are any, meaning the vertices where nothing comes out, there are no edges that have that as a, a source vertex. Um, those are the sort of final conditions as the halting states. And then if you make paths through this graph that represent those paths, uh, importantly, those paths have to respect the orientation of each of the edges, then those paths represent possible evolutions of this non-deterministic system. So they're things that we could see if we were running such a non-deterministic system. Now, that, lots of examples which I'll just skim through. Um, the main one we're gonna focus on is string rewriting systems. So that's where we have a string, computer science terminology, not physics terminology, just means 
um, a list of characters in order, like um, ABC, right? And then the rule that we're going to use to rewrite these, the schema is going to be that if we recognize a particular substring, like a particular pair of letters in order um, in the string, we can replace them with some other um, set of letters. But there are lots of um, constructs that you can phrase in terms of rewriting systems, which we're not going to get into. Maybe we might get into graph rewriting systems. Okay, why are they important? Well, I haven't given you a mathematical definition of what I mean by rewriting system, but loosely speaking, they're universal models of computation. So they model how a discrete system can change according to simple rules. Um, and probably most importantly, if, especially if they're acting on finite states, they can only, they can be implemented exactly by computers. So they, yeah, so they kind of have all the, the properties that we want for something that respects computationalism as a founding philosophy. Now, they don't assume a von Neumann architecture. If you're familiar with the history of computers, there's like a CPU that like all the computation happens in and sort of data gets pulled into the CPU and processed in some way, it's sort of a bottleneck for computation. Rewriting systems don't assume that. So they can have computational steps that apply in different parts of space, whatever space means. Um, those steps can also be non-deterministic, which would be a very bad thing for a CPU in a, a usable computer, because it would mean you wouldn't know what would happen when you ran a program. Um, and these steps don't have to be synchronized with each other. So they're very flexible. They don't make any assumptions about how computations should work. They just kind of commit to discrete models of states that change via so sort of simple rules. Okay. Oh, this was the section that I was supposed to skip. I don't know how that happened. I think I might have accidentally duplicated it. Yeah, there we go. I was going to show an example of rewriting systems that naturally model um, um, a sort of a discrete counterpart of ordinary differential equations, but we don't have time for that. Okay, so a place where rewriting systems come up a lot is one of the things I'm involved in, the Wolfram Physics Project, which is a project that is attempting to use a particular kind of rewriting system, which is a hypergraph rewriting system, as a model for fundamental physics. So in the physics project, um, simple rules rewrite hypergraphs, and they can produce sort of rich geometries. The resulting hypergraphs can be, have very beautiful and complicated forms. Um, in a sense, it's highly surprising that starting from really simple initial conditions, applying these very simple rules, you can get these quite exotic geometries that have clearly some kind of space-like structure to them. However, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to kind of concentrate on much simpler systems that um, we can actually analyze um, mathematically. So I'm gonna focus on how the evolution of the rerunning system itself forms a geometry. In other words, the possible connections of states to um, new states that are implied by the rerunning system can produce a geometry. And the really simple examples that we use for, for everything I'll talk about are string rewriting systems. And as I mentioned, they involve rerunning strings of characters according to like local patterns. So here we have a word, it's got uh, two, let's write cell, rewrite that as a white cell. So it would, for example, apply to this left-hand part of that string. That would be a match. And then when we rewrite it, we replace it with whatever's on the right-hand side of this rule. And of course, there can be more than one place that this match happens, um, in, which means that the order that you do these replacements matters. And that's what non-determinism kind of means in this setup. Now, the simplest cases are ones where the length of the substring on the right-hand side of the rule matches the length on the left. So this is not simple from that point of view because we have left-hand side is length three, right-hand side is length one. Um, if they were both length two, then it would preserve the length of the entire state, the entire string. And that's something we want to make it easy to analyze. So here's some examples. Um, we're going to have a string consisting of a black 
two black cells and two white cells. And the rule will say, if we have a black and a white cell, we change that to a white and a black cell. So what they'll end up doing is, is actually sorting the cells that all the um, black cells are on the right and all the white cells are on the left, for example. Let's see that work happen in action. So there's a match. Um, we've got a black and a white cell next to each other in that order. And there's only one match, so we just do it. And we've now flipped them around. There's, a, there's now two matches, actually. So let's see what happens if we rewrite the match on the left. We get that. But we could also rewrite the match on the right and get that. And so we go. And eventually, we end up with all the black cells on the right and all the white cells on the left, as I mentioned. You could predict that that, that would happen. So there was some non-determinism because it looked like it mattered um, which order you um, applied those rewrites, like which matches you pay attention to. And in particular, because applying some rewrites can affect whether other rewrites are replicable, so they can destroy each other. But in the end, there was only one halting state. There was only one possible result. And it's easy to see that why that would be the case. That would be because... Um, there can only be one string in which all the white cells are to the right, all the white cells are to the left of all the black cells. So the term for that is global confluence. But you can have rewrite rules that are not confluent. Here's an example. We have two rules here. Black, white goes to white, black, and white, black, white goes to white, white, white. If we start with this initial condition, we can end up in two different places depending on which of the arbitrary choices of which rewrites to do we made. But we can have systems that are locally confluent, where even if they can have multiple end states, um, actually, they necessarily have to be infinite. Um, if you wait long enough, any given choice that you made early on about which to rewrite rule to apply um, can eventually be made to not matter if you choose the right subsequent rewrite rule. So that's called a locally confluent rewriting system. Now, interestingly, these form a hypergraph. Um, how does that work? Well, the motivation for this is that you can have rules that, that produce graphs that explode in complexity and, and size. Um, and here's a string rewriting system with just three black cells and three white cells. Now there are a lot of states. Of course, they still all, all terminate in this particular sorted state at the end. But how do we kind of simplify the situation? Well, we have this big graph. And what I'm going to claim is that we can you can actually phrase this graph as a, as a simpler hypergraph. Um, I've redrawn things a little bit so that we use, instead of drawing the strings linearly, we kind of use a little horseshoe and black and white have now become blue and red to make it easier to see. But the idea is the same. So this is uh, three black cells and three white cells. And those are gonna to correspond to combinations of these sort of primitive local states that you see on the right-hand side. And you can actually read them from left to right. So um, blue, 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 red, 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 blue, 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 red, red, red. Now what happens is each of these black vertices represents a place where a match will happen if the two inputs to it are highlighted. And if they are highlighted, this match can trigger and be applied and be rewritten and the sort of highlighted part will shift down to whatever its outputs are. So let's see that actually happen. So there was one possible rewrite we could do and we applied it. Now there's actually two, both of these can match because both of the inputs are satisfied or highlighted. And again, we can make arbitrary choices about which of the available black cells whose inputs are satisfied triggers. And as we do that, we sort of shift this kind of wave front of highlightedness down the down this this object here. Uh, eventually the um, wavefront has to kind of hit the end and that's the point at which we've completely sorted this um, the string. Now the way to think about this, what is this object? Well the reason it's a hypergraph is that um, each of these black vertices is act actually representing a hyper edge. It's saying whenever you have this particular local cell, in other words, a single character next to another single character at this particular position, I want to rewrite it to another corresponding pair. So fundamentally, we can see the rewrite graph as being 
a graph that describes how global states change into each other. In other words, how entire strings change into each other and get rewritten. And the rewrite hypergraph corresponds to um, a picture that's phrased in terms of local changes only. So each of the vertices in the rewrite hypergraph is a kind of little patch of local state that gets rewritten. And as you can see, this is a set set hypergraph because these little patches are sets and there's a source patch and a target patch. So these relate to objects called Petrinets, which I won't explain right now in the interest of time. Okay, I'm gonna skip some of this, some of these sections here just because um, they're a bit wordy. And I wanna to get to maybe um, how rewrite systems can give us sort of simple kinds of geometries that we recognize from the section on transitive quivers. So the idea is that we're gonna start with um, a rewrite graph, which is just these global states and how they get rewritten to each other. And we're gonna introduce coordinates for the vertices that allow us to clarify the structure of that graph and perhaps attach cardinals to it to, to see what its underlying geometry could be. And if we're lucky, those cardinals will be, will give us a Cayley quiver, right? Or at least locally. So local patches of the rewrite graph will correspond to something a little bit like space. Maybe we'll have to glue them together in a potentially complicated way, but at least locally, there should be regularity that we can exploit that somehow emerges out of the properties of the computation that's generating this Cayley quiver. I mean, the, the rewrite quiver. So let's look at some concrete examples. So the first example is gonna be very simple. It's gonna be a string rewriting system in which the rule says, if you see a black cell and then a white cell, rewrite that to be two white cells. And let's look at what happens when we start with initial condition of black, 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 white. So for this initial condition, Notice there's only one match, it's on the far right here, it's this black white. And then if we rewrite it, we get two whites here. So what we've done is we've shrunk the length of this run of black cells by one. And we can keep doing that because we now have the same match just shifted over by one. And eventually we've run out of black cells to rewrite and now the string is all, is all white. Because there's only one run here, um, so this should say there's only one line. Because there's only one run of black cells, this line is kind of one dimensional. But if there are multiple runs, then we get multiple orthogonal quote unquote directions in the resulting graph. Let's look, look at an example of that. So I think I had to click here. Sorry, my animation didn't work there for some reason. Yeah, here we go. I'll just do it like this. So here we have an initial condition with two runs. We have a run of three black cells down there. We have a run of two black cells over here. And if we go up in this sort of picture, the sort of Y cardinal here, involves applying the match on the right-hand run. If we go left, we are applying the match on the left-hand uh, run. So we can deplete each of these independently of the other. And eventually when both are depleted, we have to stop. So we get a kind of rectangular quiver of finite size where the dimensions of that rectangular quiver are determined by the length of these initial runs here that we started with. Similarly, if we have three runs of black cells, then we get a sort of cuboid quiver, which is a finite version of a, the full infinite cubic quiver. So obviously these are the Cayley quivers of, you know, Z, Z2 and Z3, it's except truncated. They only apply in some small patch. And after that, it kind of run out of steam. So that's a really simple example. Um, let's look at these sorting rules that we looked at for earlier. So sorting rules produce these interesting partial 
square and cube and higher dimensional grids. So here's an example of a, um, a length four initial string, which produces a sort of square part over here, which corresponds to the fact that we can do two independent bits of sorting on the left and on the right. Um, and if we do one, it doesn't affect the other. If we do the other, it doesn't affect the first. But at some point, they start to affect each other and they start to kind of block each other. And at that point, you truncate off a dimension. It's just not available for you to take. For longer strings, this situation generalizes to higher dimensions. So for example, we have a partial three-dimensional grid here. There's a part here that's a cube, but there are other parts that are two-dimensional and then other parts that are one-dimensional. The mathematical name for this situation is a cube complex, by the way. And again, it's the same story. So at the beginning part of this cube here, there are three independent portions in which you can sort. But as soon as you do too many of them, they end up blocking each other. And eventually you, you kind of forced into only one that will eventually take you to the halting state. Yeah, I think I just, this is the text for what I just said. Now I wanna show a satisfying example that occurs on a more interesting situation of a circular string. So this is um, where we, uh, I'm not actually visualizing the circular string here, but you can imagine that instead of rewriting a fixed linear string, we can kind of wrap the edges of the string around together and start applying the rewriting rule on the circular string instead. And because you can't fully sort a circular string, there's no, there's no such thing as all the way on the right, it just loops back. We end up with um, a cyclic uh, rewrite graph where you can get patterns of behavior that just keep repeating around and around. Um, and I wanna show you how these generate a very familiar um, um, transitive quiver. So this is inspired by just playing around with these quivers in three dimensions. And what you notice is that if you rotate them in the right way, you can find that things sort of magically line up. Um, so they're vertices that sort of when you stack them on top of each other, you get what looks like a more familiar square quiver. Um, and the states that correspond to those vertices have properties in common that indicate that there's some sort of quotienting process going on that's making them reveal this underlying structure. And that quotienting process in this particular example is that the first two characters are the same. So black, black, or the first two um, black cells are in the same position. So that here they occupy the first two positions, here they occupy the first and the third, second and third, and so on. Another example of this kind of weird coincidence is this angle through the three-dimensional rewrite graph. This is just laid out automatically by a spring electrical embedding. It's not even something that um, there's any deep mathematical explanation for, but it's the, uh, we will be able to mathematize it shortly. So here we have the relative positions of the three characters. That's what's in common between all of the states that are uh, lining up here. So notice we've got black, black, white, black, 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 white, black, 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 white, black. And it appears that there's a triangular quiver going on here. Okay, why does that happen? So we'll visualize the simplest example, which does actually does something non-trivial, which is a circular string of four cells, four characters. And we're gonna color they're black cells. I mean, they're still underlying, they're still just black cells, but now the color just keeps track of which one is which so that we can observe them as they kind of move around. And what you see is that because there, there's only one empty character, only one white cell, um, there's only one black cell that can move at a time. It's the one that's just before that because they only move right along the circular string. So, First, the red cell moves, then the blue cell moves, then the green cell moves, and so on. And eventually, once they've all moved around by four positions, we have the same state that we started with. 
So this is a highly constrained situation where we end up getting a cycle quiver. For length five, we get a little bit more interesting behavior. It's a bit harder to see what might be going on here. But inspired by that original coincidence we saw before, we can decide to identify all of the circular strings that are equivalent under rotation. We're not forced into that move. That's just one we're going to make to try to bring out the underlying geometry here. So all of these are the same. We're just globally rotating that circular string. When we do this, we can parameterize one of these circular strings with three integers, three natural numbers. And what those natural numbers will be is the distance from each black cell to the next cell. So the number of white cells that are in between them, right? And the key point about doing that is that when we move a particular black cell, we will increase one of these numbers and decrease another number because we'd be shrinking one line of uh, run of white cells and we increasing another line of white run of white cells. But the total number of white cells is always the same. It's always going to be n minus three. Interestingly, that is the same as the presentation of the triangular quiver we saw before. But there's a constraint, which is that none of these distances, none of these number counts of uh, the lengths of what runs of white cells can fall below zero because you have to, the run can't be negative. It doesn't mean anything. And it can't be greater than N minus three because then the others would be less than zero. And that just tells us that we've got a triangular quiver, but it doesn't tell us what shape it has. Here we're visualizing um, the, this, quiver for a uh, circular string of length five. And as we change the length of that circular string, we get larger and larger triangular quivers. The rewrite graph under this quotienting operation where we identify vertis, um, circular strings that are the same under rotation is different sized triangular quivers. Uh, Tali? Mm. Just a pointer that we are five minutes away from the two hour mark since we started. And so we probably shouldn't go over 10 minutes from now because we're going to run over the next session otherwise. So just for you to know that if you want to make final points or whatever, like you have at most 10 minutes. And if you do it in, say, five minutes, we can have some quick questions and then we can move all the discussion over to Discord and gather down throughout the week. Like it's we can definitely keep on discussing this, uh, but I mean, I, I feel bad to interrupt because these are great explanations. I loved all the graphics and it's super, super pedagogic, but, um, but unfortunately we are running out of time. So just to let you know that you have five or 10 minutes, depending if you want some final comments or not. Perfect. Yeah. I think um, I'm going to skip the tree pivoting example here. Let me try to summarize what we, what we saw. We did it a non-trivial worked example, which is the geometry that's produced by circular string rewriting systems. And we saw that it gave us a kind of a somewhat exotic um, uh, transitive quiver. Um, but the kind of bigger picture is that rewriting systems given by computational processes produce geometries of some kind. It's the causality produces a geometry. And we can coordinate that, uh, that causality by finding a cardinal structure on the underlying rewrite graph. So the kind of picture then is that with the right cardinal structure, um, portions of this rewrite graph will resemble locally Cayley quivers, which means that there's a kind of way of geometrizing them that they appear to be quote unquote spatial, at least locally. Um, an intriguing point that unfortunately we'll have to leave until next time or until a different venue is that when you patch these fragments of Cayley quivers together, you can find something that seems like a quintessentially continuous uh, phenomena, which is the phenomenon of curvature. It's what allows us to think about um, more exotic spaces with positive and negative curvature like spheres or hyperbolic spaces. These have kind of been a hallmark of, of continuous classical geometry for a long time. They're, they're key to general relativity, for example, a theory of gravity. But they have a discrete manifestation precisely in the way that these um, local patches of Cayley quivers 
uh, are incompatible with each other. And I'll have to leave it there. There's more to say about that it involves holonomy and other interesting things. So that was going to be the maybe the final section. Um, I can certainly um, answer any if anyone's interested in that. I can point them at the right um, uh, parts of that. But let me uh, leave you with th these thoughts. I think I actually just made those thoughts. So that's that's probably a good place to stop. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd just be repeating myself. But another maybe small point to make is that you'll see that the same kind of mathematical structures keep coming up um, and they're structures that are relatively unexplored um, as of the current day. They're structures like multisets and hypergraphs. They're fundamentally discrete and combinatorial. They're powerful. They can model a lot of situations in the real world that are clearly very interesting to human beings. And for me, one of the most interesting, intriguing possibilities is that we can take a lot of the ideas from continuous geometry and find rich and surprising new manifestations of those ideas in the dynamics of the computational systems and in um, the setting of, of hypergraphs and graphs. And I'd like to um, just encourage people to be on the lookout for uh, hypergraph structures where they might be lurking and where there might be implicit geometries we can kind of bring out to um, apply some of these tools to better understand them. Uh, maybe I'll leave it there.